Well, hello. Hello out there in internet land, my friends, my friends. Welcome to the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. Uh, today is it's late September. It's late September, and in Vermont, we've just had the first the first frosts. The first frosts knocked out people's basil. So it goes. Well, welcome. Today, we're going to have a, just a little talk about what's been on the easel this week. This last week, I was invited to uh, start showing at a gallery in Montana. That is of interest to me because um, I love, for the last few years, I've been invited to be part of the uh, Buffalo Bell Art Show and Sale out in Cody, Wyoming. I never had the opportunity to travel out in that area of the country really before and just loved it. And uh, just it's, it's the thing that's wonderful about it is that the, the landscape is just so huge. It's just the, the space is so dominant. In New England, it, it, the landscape is much more intimate. Everything is, is, is closer together, you know. Um, and going out there, it was just like, whoa, a very kind of um, not a very sophisticated response to this landscape, but just a very heartfelt and immediate response. So I got invited to uh, start showing at this gallery called the Old Main Gallery uh, in Montana because a friend of mine, a, a fellow Vermonter, uh, Jim Westphalen, is a wonderful, wonderful photographer. And he did a show out there and the show went very well. And the gallerists were like, do you know anybody else who's terrific? Um, and he was kind enough to think I was terrific. So he suggested uh, I get in touch with them or they get in touch with me. And they invited me to do a few pieces for this fall. Now you may have noticed, you may have noticed that there's a thing going on this year called COVID-19, AKA the Covefe virus. And the Covefe virus is not very, um, travel is not, is not one of the things that the Covefe virus really likes us doing a lot. So I did not go out to the Buffalo Bell Art Show and Sale this year, though it was, it just took place this last week. Um, I am not about to go out to Montana and North Dakota and travel around and snap pictures of grain elevators. Uh, instead, I'm having to utilize this thing that I've heard about called the internet. Now, Betty Sue, could we go to the next slide, please? Which is a picture of my studio with the painting that I have been working on this week. There we are. Um, this. And we're going to tell the story of, of the journey of this painting. So this is, this is the corner of my studio uh, that is the opposite corner of the studio that is ruled by Corduroy, the studio cat. This corner of the studio, Corduroy sits underneath the table that's immediately to the right, uh, and Corduroy offers opinions, but she does not dominate this area. This is my area. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. So I went on to the interwebs and I did my usual thing, which is to go on to Flickr uh, and type in Montana, Barnes, Rural, just to see what's out there. Didn't find anything much on Flickr. Hey, it's John Porter Lasseter IV. What's up, Charles? Well, I'm talking about the process of painting during the era of COVID. Um, so didn't didn't catch anything on, on, on Flickr. Then I typed in like WPA photos of Montana. Didn't nothing really caught my eye there. And then I just typed in various keywords and stumbled across this Facebook site called abandoned Montana until they all fall down and found this photograph on there. Now, this is precisely up my wheelhouse also because the gallerists had said they particularly liked a painting of mine called Milk Sheds that I should have put in this slideshow, but I forgot. 
I forgot, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but it was it was of two milk sheds out in San, out on a ranch outside San Angelo, Texas, that had a similar. The structure has a similar feel to this in that it's two, it's two structures with kind of a breezeway connecting. This, of course, is more with the barn, but it's still it's the thing of having space, object, hole in object, which gives the sense of even more space and space. Um, so anyway, so this this photograph caught my eye. So what I always do when I see a photograph that I might like to work on a painting from, from which I might like to work on a painting to do it grammatically correctly. I always contact the photographer, explain who I am, what I do, and uh, say, you know, there's the website of my stuff. Uh, my usual policy, what I always offer is, if I use a photograph as an armature for a painting, I pay a hundred, I offer a hundred dollars and I always credit the photographer. And the photographer here, photographer here is a woman named Lisselle Mosberg. Uh, so I contacted her and offered it and uh, offered my deal. And she said, paint whatever you want. Um, just direct people to my website. And so I have agreed. Everybody should visit uh, her, her, her Facebook page. Abandon Montana until they all fall down. Hello, Peter Moffat. Hello, Marty Hill Blesdo. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide, Betty Sue? Same photograph, same photograph. Go back to the previous one. Okay, looking at this one, what I what I was not terribly interested in was the fact that the light was not hitting the front of the, of the structure. Uh, I really liked the shadow uh, inside the structure. Um, I did not, whenever I work from a photograph, I really don't want to just copy the photo. I want to use the structure or structures in the, in the photograph as the armature for my painting. Um, I do not seek out photographs with really distinctive point of view. I mean, this does have the point of view of she got very, very low on the ground. Um, but that that feels to me just like that is a choice. You are you can either be, you know, lying on the ground, on your knees, crouched, or standing full up, or up on a ladder. That's but aside from that. This photograph is just a direct portrait of this building, or at least that's the part of this photograph that I am choosing to work on for my painting. So now we go to the next, the next photograph. This is the same photo. On the computer, I just manipulated it till I got something that was doing the job of what I needed this armature to be doing for me. And then I took a screenshot of it, and that was that. Next slide, please. Then I go to my studio, and I do a crappy, just on regular paper, a crappy printout on my printer of both the original, that's on the right, the uh, screenshot, that's on the top, and then I do a little pencil sketch to decide where I want to place the painting, the, um, the, the structure in my painting. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. This is a close up of the sketch. You'll see that initially, uh, the, the, first, the first thumbnail is the smaller one by two. Okay, so I, it was going to be a one by two. I have a bunch of uh, 24 by 48. Uh, panels of uh, stretch canvases. Um, so I knew it was gonna be one by two. And my initial sketch, I just did a thumbnail of the, the, of the barn, knew I wanted that in this dead center because this is a portrait of that building, right? It, then the question is, where do I put the horizon line? And in my first little sketch, 
the horizon line felt low. So I expanded the rectangle. That's the second rectangle out darker. So it's really, it's just back to the old rule of thirds on the horizontals. The horizon line is basically at the bottom third. That's why you should all buy my video. You should all buy my video, ladies and gentlemen. We talk about the rule of thirds. And we also talk about the very, very important thing in, in painting, which is to get out of the way of the painting. So I did this little thumbnail to determine where I wanted to put the structure in the, um, in the context of the, of, the, uh, of the canvas itself. And then next slide, Betty Sue. Then I did my projecting, which I get to do, ladies and gentlemen, because I sketch all the time. And if I sketch from life, that makes me feel like I can project when I am doing a studio canvas. If you don't know how to draw, don't, don't jump immediately to projecting. It's going to make you miserable. Uh, it's going to feel like cheating. And uh, you won't learn anything. I have put in hundreds of hours of sketching, and I have the sketchbooks to prove it. All right? So no shortcuts. Anyway, so I did my I did the projection using that blown out uh, version of the photograph. So I really am just concentrating on the structure. And then with acrylic paint, so this is a 24 by 48 uh, stretch canvas, uh, triple coated with acrylic gesso. Then with a very thin wash of acrylic paint, I, um, hang on, let me call up my, my cheat sheet. About the colors that I used. Um, the color for the structure is acrylic, Viridian and burnt sienna mixed together, okay? Um, but it's very, very watery, which is why the value is so light. I did not add any white to the acrylic paint mixture there. So by doing a thin acrylic wash and then with a hair dryer drawing it, drying it, I really got the first pass with the structure in, in about 45 minutes. Um, and then with for the grasses, I made a uh, transparent oxide yellow and uh, unbleached titanium acrylic. And using just a chip brush, a hardware store chip brush, just brushed in a watery, watery mixture of that. That gave me basically everything I need, needed to know to know if I liked where this painting was going. And this was feeling solid to me at this point. And then I did the very, very important thing, ladies and gentlemen. And I talk about this a lot in my video. I took my coffee. I sat down in my chair about 10 feet away and I went, hmm. Hmm. That is, I did not just start painting and painting and painting. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. And ladies and gentlemen, thank my beloved Betty Sue. She's down there in Austin, Texas. She's very, very tired. She's still doing all this technical work for, for me. I so appreciate it. If, if any of you are free this evening, you should join us for Nobody's Happy Hour. That's Betty Sue's. Uh, Betty Sue's musical event that she does every Tuesday night from 7.30 to 9 Eastern Time or 6.30 to 8 Central Time with different musical guests. We spin the wheel of misfortune and people, they have to do cover songs of songs they don't know that we in the audience suggest they, they do. You all should join us. I post about it on my Facebook page and I'll post about it in Charlie Hunter Art too. Or maybe Betty Sue could type in the, the address for it down at the, the bottom crawl thing. Anyway, so as I sat there drinking my coffee and going, hmm, I decided what I wanted to do was not the dramatic sky, 
of this of, of of the original photograph. Again, I did not want to just copy this other artist's work. I wanted to make this my own. And one of the things I love about out there in Wyoming and Montana and North Dakota are those the skies, the, the severe, severe skies. Just the, the, the severity of the landscape and the palette of that severe landscape, I adore. So I took a, I mean, I, I took a mix of Amsterdam acrylic ink. Now, Amsterdam acrylic ink is, Amsterdam is the brand. It's made by Royal Talents, for who, whom I am an ambassador. So they send me neat stuff to play with. And they recently had sent me some bottles of their acrylic ink. And if you're an airbrush artist, it would be fantastic. But I'm not. But it's just highly, highly pigmented liquid. And you can intermix it with other acrylic paints. You can intermix it with uh, acrylic medium. Um, it's, it's just very versatile. Uh, very, it, but it, it has the consistency of like um, apple cider, uh, orange juice, you know, slightly thicker than water, but uh, gosh, it's lovely. Um, so I took some Amsterdam acrylic ink of a color called graphite. So it's slightly, um, it has some ground up mica in it. So it's, it's, it's like a slightly pearlescent gray, um, a touch of Payne's gray, some titanium white uh, um, and mix those it mix those together the titanium white was was regular acrylic uh, regular body acrylic paint so I mixed those together added some water and just brushed that brush that into the sky and then thinned it out heading down to the horizon so I worked from top to bottom I had my plant sprayer handy so I'm hitting the surface as I'm brushing it in order to not have the brush lines really show up. The, the barn was already painted in in the, um, in the Viridian Burnt Sienna mix, okay? So I think I did the barn. I know I did the barn first, then I did the sky, and then I did the, uh, a second pass with the grasses. And the second pass with the grasses was using some transparent oxide yellow and titanium white uh, mixed together. I think there may have been a hint of that uh, burnt sienna tossed in, um, looking especially over there on the right. Um, but again, just another simple wash. So it's now two washes of that, of that yellow, and I'm not spending time really thinking about individual grasses. Next slide, please. This is a, when I was going through all my photo, you know, going through the interwebs, uh, looking for stuff about Montana, I did a, took a screenshot of this. Not that I would ever paint something as lugubrious as this, but I really liked the color of the grasses. Um, and I just want to kind of keep that as a reference note that that, if I could, if I could hit if I could hit some of those tones uh, in my depictions of Montana, I would be very happy. But I don't, I'm not about to start painting people on horses. That's Jim Woodard territory. I wouldn't dare go there. I wouldn't dare go there. Next slide, please, ladies and gentlemen. So this is where we are at now. This is the third pass. How liftable is the acrylic ink? It's totally liftable until it's dry. It's just. It's just very, very, you know, you know, Golden's um, open, not open, Golden's liquid acrylics, the, the kind of the ones that come in the, the squeeze tube. It's just, it's more liquid than that. Um, it's more, it's a little more watery than that, but the pigmentation is, is incredible. But once it's dry, it's down there, just like all acrylic is. But when it is wet, it lifts beautifully. So the third pass, um, what I did was I made a, I went in with oils. This is, I've started to go in with oils here. Cobra water mixable oil, titanium white mixed with titanium buff, that is unbleached titanium, 
And then some of their number 87, Painting Paste. Painting Paste has the consistency of Vaseline. It is basically paint without any pigment in it. And then I took some of their 93 Quick Dry Medium, which is Quick Dry Medium, obviously, which I do not really, I don't like any Quick Dry Mediums used purely, generally, because they start, they set up too quickly and it starts getting too draggy too fast. But I do appreciate a quick dry medium when I'm working in the studio and don't want to wait 10 days to have uh, a passage be ready to work on again. Um, so rather than using like the Cobra painting medium, I will use the quick dry medium, but then I add a little bit of artisan, that is Windsor Newton's water mixable brand, artisan safflower oil. Um, to cut the quick the quick dryingness of the quick dry medium. And then just a spritz of water, which kind of activates the whole thing. And I mix that up really well on my glass palette with the palette knife. And then I brush from the horizon up into the sky. So there was the original pass down of the acrylic paint, the gray passing through kind of more watery, getting down to the horizon. And then now working with oils, having a semi-opaque glaze going from the horizon up into the sky. Very, very neutral, very, very neutral colors. You know, the, the, that whole, the whole sky, I mean, it's, it's, it's bluish as opposed to warm but it's not a it's not a blue blue um and i did not want to play with uh reflected you know the grass reflecting in the sky color i wanted to have this be kind of a severe painting so okay so i did the glaze up into the sky and then um for the grass i took cobra yellow ochre little bit of burnt sienna and then some more of that glazing that semi-opaque white glazing mix and i almost dry brushed like still using the chip brush from the hardware store almost dry brushed another coating on top of that then in the barn itself i took burnt sienna and van dyke brown and did my darkest darks so those are warm it's a little bit lost in this slide, but one of the things I'm proudest of about this painting is the interior of the barn. It's dark, dark, but it is, it's warm. Um, it has a transparency in it. Um, and I really did just a couple of brushy passes uh, on the, on the uh, pressed tin. Um, on the corrugated tin, tin. It, it really is not, there's very, very little additional work that I did on this between the first pass. And you'll see, you'll see the, the, I should have done a close up of this, but the press tin, the corrugated tin, really, I just took the squeegee with a bead of paint, put it down for the horizon. Then I took clean paper towel and just pulled with a clean paper towel, and that gives the illusion of the corrugations. It's just done, if, if you're careful, and if you practice a lot, you can do these very simple illusions that make things appear to be extremely detailed, even though they are not. Next slide, Betty Sue. So this is where things are in the studio at present. Um, it's sitting, uh, I've now taken it off of the easel. I'm letting it cure for a few days over at the side. And I'm not sure whether it's done or not. Um, yeah, Mustafa, oh, I wanted to say on that, the, my New England paintings, I think I've got a much more complex uh, emotional response to New England. Cause I'm, I'm from, I'm from New England. I'm not from, Montana. So this is, these are just kind of a direct emotional response. It's, it's less nuanced than uh, 
than than something that I know a lot. It's, these are these are kind of more like the tourists' view of uh, of Montana. Um, ha ha ha, Ken Winkler, you're 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 that's that's very funny. Anyway, so this painting is curing over at the uh, at the studio now, and I'm now started on another. Uh, I found another painting that uh, Lucille Mossberg had done at Abandon Montana until they all fall down Facebook page. Um, next slide, Betty Sue. Now we're going to go into shameless commerce for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. The other thing I've been doing of late is uh, I've, I've been working with um, Judy Lighty, who has uh, a little soap company in the same building as my studio. And we have created reasonably fine brush soap, ladies and gentlemen. Reasonably fine brush soap. It's a very, very simple brush soap. It's very pure. It's got a lot of oils in it. So it cleans your brushes and then it conditions them beautifully. Um, if you'd like to buy some reasonably fine brush, brush soap, sustainably sourced from Bellows Falls, Vermont, Right there on the screen. You can go to Hunter Studio and then pull down and store the wearables section, or you can go to Silver Screen Design, which is where the um, t shirts that I sell, the reasonably fine artist t shirts, and reasonably fine artist hats, it's where you can get those. And you can also get this brush soap. And just know you'll be getting good food to the cats. The cats will not be starving if you buy this brush soap, and neither will I, and neither will Judy Lighty with Grace and Miss Mouse soaps in Bellows Falls, Vermont. Um, so I am indeed from New England, Mustafa. Now Mustafa keeps thinks I'm from Ghana because uh, on on Eric Rhodes. Uh, the Dreamliner, uh, Eric Rhodes Daily Facebook Live thing. He always says, say where you're from. And me being an inveterate smart ass, always say I'm from Ghana. But no, Mustafa, I, but you know, Vermont's a lot like Ghana. Yep, Vermont made reasonably fine brush soap. That is correct, Martha Rowley. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, don't know what we'll have next week, but the week after that, we're gonna have a little chat with, uh, Danny Lichtenfeld, who is the director of the Brattleboro Museum. We're going to have a discussion about museums uh, during the time of COVID. Uh, until then, take good care, wash your hands, and we'll see you uh, soon. Thanks again for, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>